Alan Irwin with Santa Barbara Infrared, back again for our marathon on radiometric testing. Uh, this is part two, where we're going to be talking about the practicalities of performing the test. This is where all the math will be hidden. So right off the bat, let's talk about some of the equipment. To perform this test, we need a source where we know the spectral components and we can characterize the radiance coming off of our source, and that's typically a black body. We're also going to need an optical system that can project the energy and where we, again, know the components, the optical transmission based on spectral components. All of those are important, so we have a well-defined target projection system. And a key component of that is the target. And we characterize the target that's going to be projected by knowing its size so we know how much energy is coming off of the system. We can take all those components, and what we show here is a schematic, an optical schematic, showing these key pieces. The black body, the target, the collimating optic, the transmission through the atmosphere, and then the components of the camera, which is the collecting optic that focuses it down onto the, the focal plane array. Those are the key components, and we're going to be looking at that a little bit later, so it's important to have that in mind. The way the test is run is how we would run most noise tests. We are going to collect a series of images at a particular temperature so that we can see the variance on that one pixel. That's our noise. And we're also going to be taking that information at two different temperatures so that we can see the response of a pixel. And that will give us our noise per response. And now the key part that comes up next is how much energy are we really talking about and how do we calculate it. So here's our basic Planck formulation. We are looking at the energy coming off of our black body that's being emitted but we're also concerned with what it's reflecting from the environment, the ambient temperature. So we're going to be calculating the energy of the black body as well as the energy in the ambient environment, and we're going to use our emissivity knowledge and our spectral dependence on emissivity to calculate what is coming off of the black body, what's the amount of energy coming off of that black body. We're also interested in looking at the thermal difference or the radiant difference between two different temperatures that the camera is looking at. That's how we're calculating our response of an individual pixel. And to look at those two different temperatures, we're going to assume that the background radiance stays the same. Everything that we're reflecting from the ambient temperature will stay the same. So we can simplify this complex differential formula into a little bit simpler term where we're looking at the energy that we expect to be arriving, or the difference in energy that we expect to be arriving at our uh, sensor. Finally, there are the spectral components of the atmosphere that we're being transmitting, that we are transmitting through. And we're going to take that into account um, along with the transmission of all the optics by integrating across our spectral band of interest. This is the spectral band that the sensor is going to be responding to. So across that band, we need to integrate these curves to get the total energy that should be arriving at the camera. So here's our apparent radiance at the camera. And using these values, we can now come to a formulation for noise equivalent radiance. We've done these calculations so we know our variance, we know the response of the pixel, and we know the apparent radiance coming into the camera, so we can calculate, fairly straightforward, our noise equivalent radiance value. Easy enough. When we come to noise equivalent power, now we're getting to a more complex form of the equation. To determine the noise equivalent power, or the flux that's coming out into the camera, we are looking at the radiance from the back black body. That's the calculated radiance. We need to multiply that by the area of the target, what we're limiting to. Remember, the radiant flux is normalized. So we take the area of the target. And we also need to take the angular subtense, the solid angle, that we are collecting using our primary optic. So we have the area of the target the solid angle defined by our optical component, and that is the area of the optics divided by the square of the focal length. It's just the way that we calculate that, that solid angle. We multiply those times the radiance, remember it's that normalized value from Planck's constant, to calculate what our total flux is off of this system. Those are the key components. Now we're going to create a ratio, a noise ratio, which is basically what our measured noise is divided by the total response of the pixel. But that gives us then our radiant noise, or our flux noise, coming out of the collimator as it arrives at the camera. That's part, the first part of our calculation. The next part is the noise equivalent power, the fraction of the total noise that's actually getting to our key component, which is a sensor in the focal plane array. And there, what we're dividing is the angular subtense of a single pixel. We're dividing by the total angular subtense of the sensor to the primary optic. And we can then take that 
fraction times the energy that's arriving to come up with the total flux that is occurring at a single sensor. So that's the noise equivalent power that's arriving at the front that's getting to a single, uh, single element in our sensor. We combine those two equations, the two parts, and when we find our noise equivalent radiance calculation, we can normalize and simplify some of this equation. So we get this. The noise equivalent power is equal to the noise equivalent radiance times the IFOV, that's this angular subtense of a single uh, pixel, single sensor element, squared, that's the angular subtense squared to give us our, our basically our solid angle, times the area of the camera's optics. It's, you have to go through all the math to get to this point, and it's a fairly simple formula, and we can simplify it because we've made several assumptions, including that the background ambient temperature stays the same, uh, that we're not in flux, that things are constant, but we can get the simplified formulation because we can eliminate a lot of the terms, they, they cancel each other out, to come up with this form of the noise equivalent power. There are additional terms that come into play at the edge. All of our calculations, we've been assuming that it's a single pixel in sort of a field, which is the focal plane. When we start getting to the edge of everything, we get into additional effects. There's the airy disk, there's the Raleigh, curve, Raleigh uh, effects on the edges. These things come into play and affect the, Im the response of our pixels at the very edge of our focal plane and the very edge of our optics. So we're going to assume in these calculations that we have come away from the edge, at least two rows and two columns away for these formulas to be valid. This is why this becomes a very complex field. We have to start dealing with edge issues, literally, uh, when we start looking at the total response of my focal plane. But to simplify down, and we look at the interior of the focal plane, these are the assumptions and this is the ca these calculations hold for those uh, central components in our focal plane. When we then look at calculating a noise equivalent irradiance, we take the total power that's arrived at our sensor and we divide by the area of the sensor that's taking that measurement. Remember, irradiance is flux divided by the area of the sensor element. And that's what we do here. Noise equivalent power divided by the area of the uh, sensor element gives us our noise equivalent irradiance or noise equivalent flux density. Finally, we come to D star or specific detectivity. Now the formulation is pretty straightforward. We are taking the noise equivalent power and we're normalizing it to the area of the detector and the bandwidth of our signal measurement system. These two come into play so that what we end up with is a unit of meter root hertz divided by watts. This formulation allows a couple of things in terms of D star being higher or being better with better sensors, as opposed to most noise measurements where the better the sensor, the smaller the noise. It also takes into account the um, uh, bandwidth of your, of your electronics. There are other components that come into play. The problem is D-star is rarely used anymore. It's an older measurement. It was important when we had single element detectors. But now that we're talking about focal planes, there are other measurements that become critical, such as noise, that limit the uh, response of our system. We're not as concerned with D-star anymore. So it's important to know where it comes from and what it's about. It's not all that important to understand how to use it. OK, those are the formulations. Now there's some critical assumptions that we've done throughout this to simplify it, and that's the problem with a lot of radiometric measurements, is that we tend to believe the simplifications are in fact reality without keeping in mind what those simplifications have been. One is that we've assumed the environment is at thermal equilibrium, which is really hard to achieve. In most situations, you could have a fan or somebody walking by. Um, all of these, uh, air conditioner comes on, all of those elements change the thermal equilibrium. It creates a dynamic environment, and so some of our assumptions in creating these calculations are invalid. So thermal equilibrium is an important one, which is why a lot of these measurements are done in closed rooms where the operator is not allowed to move around so that everything can come to equilibrium and stay at a constant value. We've also made some assumption about the camera optics, that they're being smaller than the exit aperture of the collimator. That's to avoid all of the optical edge effects that occur with a lot of these systems, um, and we're only dealing with the edge effects of the camera itself. If you match the camera optic to the optic of the output, you have some additional complexity, especially around the edges, and that we're not discussing here, but need to come into play when you're looking at sort of the response of those edges on our uh, sensors. We are also assuming the ambient temperature doesn't change, and that's also remarkably hard to do. 
it's, re -hard, it's hard to do that and also maintain thermal equilibrium because one of your first thoughts in maintaining a constant temperature environment is have an air conditioner. But every time that air conditioner comes in, we're providing a thermal non-equilibrium. And so maintaining a constant temperature through the course of the day when you're doing tests is not easy. Light hitting into your, on your room. I mean, you can just take a thermometer, put it up on the wall and see how the temperature changes over the course of a day and you will get different responses because you saw in the formulas where they were and where we tried to simplify them out. So all of those assumptions combine to make it a very difficult measurement to have both repeatable and be accurate. And you've got to control those elements to stick with the simpler formulas or understand all the elements well enough that you can go to the more complex formulations and still get valid results or at least repeatable results. Finally, how is this thing used? Well, the uses of radiometric measurements are that we can, pretty much like we would use any noise measurement, we can characterize and detect failures within a camera, we can compare different devices within a model series, and we can compare some measurements across different camera models as long as we understand how they've been measured and to make sure that they've all been measured properly or accurately so that we're not chasing different components, that we are actually dealing with all of those assumptions that we've had before and we understand what the calculations are. Again, radiometric measurements, radiometry in general is not easy. There's a lot of complexity to it. It can be thought of simply as substituting temperature with radiometric units and it's not that. You have a lot more components going on that you need to keep track of and to control to get good measurements out. So this has been an introduction to all of these concepts. If you're really going to get into doing radiometric measurements, well, experience is the best teacher. Get out there and actually take some measurements, see how hard it is to control all the different elements, and continue to research it. We've only touched on it. We went through a lot of material to just touch on it, and there's a lot more depth to it as well. Thanks very much for sticking it out, and uh, that's it for this radiometric series.